Hello friends, this video on cell part 3 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So now that we have introduced cell, so now we have to see uh, different aspects of cell, that is the number of cells which are present in a living organism. Well, it again varies. So if we want, if we can actually look at different organisms and we see that the number of cells in an organism can vary from one to many. And when I say many, this many can go to millions or billions or even trillions. So just imagine the number can go as high as possible. So when I say a billion, a billion is nothing but so it can actually go to millions or billions. When I say billions, billions is nothing but 10 to the power 3 millions. Again, when I say trillions, that is nothing but 10 to the power 6 millions. So just imagine the number, the numbers are huge. So basically when uh, we say the number of cells in an organism, it can be anything and it can be as low as 1 also. So based on the number of cells present in an organism, they can be classified into two types, unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms. So uni means one and multi means many. That means organisms with one cell, they are called unicellular organisms, whereas organisms with multiple cells are called multicellular organisms. So let us quickly see uh, unicellular organisms. So these organisms are made up of one cell. So the entire body of the organism is made up of just one cell and that one cell will perform all the functions that the organism has to perform to survive. So this single cell performs the basic functions that are characteristic of the organism. For example, that organism in order to live, it, it needs to eat, it also needs to excrete out the waste products, it also needs to, need to respire, it also needs to have a circulatory system. So everything will be taken care by that one cell. So that one cell is like jack of all trades. So it is capable of doing everything and it will do everything. So let us look at some of the examples of unicellular organisms. So one example is amoeba. So we have heard of amoeba, right, in, uh, in our chapter on microorganisms. So there we saw that amoeba is a microorganism, which is extremely small, so we cannot see it with the naked eye. So which cl class of microorganism that does amoeba belong to? Yes, it belongs to protozoa. So these amoeba, if you look at amoeba, it has got a shape which keeps on changing. This is how the shape of amoeba is. I mean, it is neat. It, it is not a specific shape and the shape is also arbitrary and that too, it keeps on changing with time. So this entire amoeba is just one cell. So this entire thing which you see here is just one cell and this one cell will perform all the function. So this one cell will help the amoeba to move from one place to another. It will also help amoeba to eat food. It will also help to excrete out the waste product. So everything will be taken care by this one cell. So let us look at some other examples like Chlamydomonas. So this is again a unicellular organism and this is also a microorganism. And it belongs to which class? It is an algae. Yes. So this is how Chlamydomonas looks like. So you would have often seen these kind of algae on the surface of water bodies. So when the water gets a green colored carpet on its surface, so that is nothing but due to the formation of algae. So Chlamydomonas is also unicellular. So if you look at it under microscope, this is how one single Chlamydomonas looks like. And it, this entire structure is just one cell. So this is how it looks like. So this is the entire cell. Inside the cell you have the various parts like nucleus. Just now I was telling right that nucleus is a very vital part of the cell. Chloroplast, pyrenoid. So we will talk about the parts of the cell later. So let us look at another example of unicellular organism that is paramecium. So paramecium is also a microorganism which is a protozoa. So this is also one particular cell which we see in paramecium. So one cell will take care of all the functions that need to be performed.
So this paramecium, these are ciliate organisms. That is, they have cilia for their locomotion. So we saw these, uh, we have already seen paramecium in our lessons on microbes. So here if you see on the outer surface, you have small hair-like structures. So these structures are called cilia and, and it helps them to locomote, that is to move from one place to another. So paramecium, they are generally found in either freshwater or marine environment. They are even found in stagnant ponds or basins and this they are also called as sleeper animal cule. Now why are they called as sleeper animal cule? That's because of their appearance. So if you look at the structure of a paramecium, they, they resemble quite like a slipper, right? And that is why they are called sleeper animal cule. So this is another unicellular organism. Next examples of unicellular are bacteria. Now in bacteria, they are available in a variety of shapes and sizes. You have bacteria which are spherical, elongated, uh, spindle shaped. I mean many different shapes of bacteria exist and all of them are unicellular. These bacteria, they are amongst the first life forms which existed on earth. So if you look at bacteria under microscope, so this is how it looks like. If you talk about their habitat, they are found in a variety of habitats like soil, water, uh, inside the body of plants or animals. So, I mean, bacteria are found almost anywhere and everywhere. So, you can say that. So, they are another example of unicellular organisms. So now let us talk about multicellular organisms. These organisms have multiple cells, that is many cells together form that organism. Now here in these organisms, now since there are so many cells, in case of unicellular, what was happening? There is just one cell and that one cell performs all the functions for that organism. But here we have many cells. Now this many can be millions or billions or trillions of cells. So which cell is going to perform which function or all of them are going to perform all the functions. So how is it like? So here there is division of labor in multicellular organisms. Now what do we mean by division of labor? It's like the hard work or the labor gets divided. Now it is, let us take an example. Let us suppose there, there is just one student in a class and the teacher says that the class has to organize Teacher's Day on 5th September. Now what will happen if there is just one student in the class, then that one student has to arrange everything to organize Teacher's Day. So he has, to, that person has to take care of the cultural program, that person has to take care of the seating arrangement, the same person has to take care of the decoration and everything. So all the responsibility is on that particular student. Now instead of one, if there are 50 students in the same class, then what's going to happen? Now, there are 50 students in the class and there are so many jobs which need to be done for your teacher's day. Now, what the students decide is, okay, 10 of them will take care of decoration, 10 of them will take care of the cultural program, 10 of them will take care of the seating arrangement. So that's how the labor or the hard work got divided. In a very similar way, in multicellular organisms, the labor gets divided. That means a group of cells perform a particular function. Again, another group of cells performs another function. Again, you have a third group of cells which perform a third function. So that's how the labor gets divided between the multiple cells. So some organisms also have cells of various kinds. Now it is not necessary that let us suppose we take example of an elephant. Now an elephant might have millions of cells inside its body. That doesn't mean that all the cells have to be identical to each other. It is also possible that it has the, the animal has different types of cells. Some cells are spherical, some cells are elongated. So they can be of different types. Why? Because not all of them are going to perform the same function. So depending upon the function they perform, they might be of different shapes. So if you look at human beings, our body has trillions of cells. So there are so many cells inside our body and they all perform different functions. Like a group of cells perform a specific function. So if you look at some of the cells inside our body, like the blood cells, if you talk about blood cells, there are red blood cells, white blood cells. So 
they look different than the muscle cells. If you, whether they are the smooth muscle cells or the striated muscle cells, they look quite different. Here, if you see, they are elongated with tapered ends. Whereas if you look at the blood cells, they are more or less spherical. If you look at the nerve cell, the nerve cell again, they look so different. This is how the nerve cell look like. Let me draw it completely. It is not drawn completely here. So this is how the nerve cell look like. So if you see at see the nerve cell, it is a branched structure. So it looks so very different from a smooth muscle cell. Similarly, if you look at the fat cell, again, fat cell looks so different. It's like a big globular structure. So different cells look different from each other. That's because of their different functions. Again, when you look at the sperm cell, it has a different structure. It has a flagella. Why? Because the sperm cells have to be motile. They have to move from one place to another. So one organism might have different varieties of cells and those cells may be of different structure because of the different functions which they perform. So now for these multicellular organisms also, the number of cells, it gradually increases with time. That means it starts with one cell. For example, in human beings, how does a human being arise? I mean, a baby is born, right? So that's how the human life begins. But even before the baby is born, the baby stays inside the mother's womb for nine months. So what happens at the beginning of the nine month? So the entire process of origination or formation of a human being starts from fertilization. That is, an egg gets fertilized. So a female releases an egg, male releases a sperm cell. When sperm and egg combines, the egg gets fertilized and this fertilized egg is nothing but the baby which is born because that fertilized egg later developed. So your fertilized egg is somewhat like this. So this is a fertilized egg. With time it keeps on dividing to form cluster of cells and this process keeps on continuing for nine months. Now as the number of cells increases, some of these cells start grouping up together and they start performing a specific function. Some cells group together to form the fingers, some cells group together to form hair, some cells group together to form eyes and that's how it gets divided and different organs are formed and that's how a baby is born. So that's how even in multicellular organism, the formation of so many cells that also starts from one single cell. So here you can see the as it was told in the cell theory that all cells arise from pre-existing cells. So that holds true here that all these trillions of cells which exist inside the human body, they all have actually arose from one single cell and that one single cell was nothing but the fertilized egg. Now even if you are not able to understand what exactly the fertilized egg is or what is egg, what is sperm, we will talk about all that in your higher classes when you learn in detail about reproduction. So for now you just understand that multicellular organisms also, all these multiple cells, they actually arise from one single cell. Now the number of cells are all, is also not dependent on the size of the organism. Like right? Many people think that if an organism is really big in size, for example an elephant, so definitely it is going to have more cells. But if an organism is going to be small in size, for example a mouse, then definitely it is going to have lesser number of cells. So that is not the case. It is independent of the size of the organism. For example, if you look at an elephant, you would agree that it has, it, it is extremely huge when compared to human beings. But when you look at the number of cells, human beings have trillions of cells. And elephants, they have billions of cells, billions or trillions. So what I'm trying to say is the number of cells inside an elephant and inside a human being, they are comparable, but their sizes are not comparable. So number of cells in an organism is not really dependent on the size of that organism. Thank you. Please visit www.examfear.com to watch more educational videos with a better experience. Please do not forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for latest updates. Thank you once again.